Let's talk about myths, baby. And I am your host, Liv, back here with another episode of my reading of the Argonautica. I've said it before, but I honestly love that I get to intersperse the conversation episodes with these ones as well. I feel like it's best for everyone because you kind of get a bit of everything. And also, you know, sometimes it's a little bit easier for me to just read out all of this nonsense and provide it to you. Plus, it's fun. And who doesn't love to hate Jason? Which leads us directly into, we are about to start book three of the Argonautica, which means that where we last left our intrepid Argonauts, they had finally, after so many trials and tribulations, reached Colchis, where the king is Aetes and the princess is Medea. Ugh, so ready for this part. I mean, I'm sure it's going to make Jason look good. And what is there to do about that? But we all know the truth. <laughs> it is all about Medea. One quick note before we begin, this chapter refers to Aphrodite a lot as Cypris. She is the Cyprian goddess or the Catharian goddess, Cypris being Cyprus, all of these things. It just means that that's often what she is called. And in this case, she is exclusively called Cypris, it seems. So if you hear that word, or that name, and you think, who the hell is that? It's Aphrodite. This is the Argonautica by Apollonius, translated by R. C. Seton, Book Three, Part One. Come now, Erato, stand by my side and say next how Jason brought back the fleece to Iolcus, aided by the love of Medea. For thou sharest the power of Cypris, and by thy love cares dost charm unwedded maidens, wherefore to thee too is attached a name that tells of love. Thus the heroes unobserved were waiting in ambush amid the thick reed beds, but Hera and Athena took note of them, and, apart from Zeus and the other immortals, entered a chamber and took counsel there, and Hera first made trial of Athena. Do thou now first, daughter of Zeus, give advice? What must be done? Wilt thou devise some scheme whereby they may seize the golden fleece of Aetes and bear it to Hellas? Or can they deceive the king with soft words and so work persuasion? Of a truth he is terribly overweening. Still it is right to shrink from no endeavor. Thus she spoke, and at once Athena addressed her. I, too, was pondering such thoughts in my heart, Hera, when thou didst ask me outright. But not yet do I think that I have conceived a scheme to aid the courage of the heroes, though I have balanced many plans. She ended, and the goddesses fixed their eyes on the ground at their feet, brooding apart, and straightway Hera was the first to speak her thought. Come, let us go to Cypris, let both of us accost her and urge her to bid her son, if only he will obey, speed his shaft at the daughter of Aetes, the Enchantress, and charm her with love for Jason, and I deem that by her device he will bring back the fleece of Hellas. Thus she spoke, and the prudent plan pleased Athena, and she addressed her in reply with gentle words. Hera, my father, begat me to be a stranger to the darts of love, nor do I know any charm to work desire, but if the word pleases thee, surely I will follow, but thou must speak when we meet her. 
So she said, and starting forth they came to the mighty palace of Cypris, which her husband, the halt-footed god, had built for her when first he brought her from Zeus to be his wife. And entering the court, they stood beneath the gallery of the chamber where the goddess prepared the couch of Hephaestus. But he had gone early to his forge and anvils in a broad cavern in a floating island where with the blast of flame he wrought all manner of curious work. And she alone was sitting within, on an inlaid seat facing the door. And her white shoulders on each side were covered with the mantle of her hair, and she was parting it with a golden comb and about to braid up the long tresses. But when she saw the goddesses before her, she stayed and called them within, and rose from her seat and placed them on couches. Then she herself sat down, and with her hands gathered up the locks still uncombed, and smiling, she addressed them with crafty words. "'Good friends, what intent, what occasion brings you here after so long? Why have you come, not too frequent visitors before, chief among goddesses that you are?' And to her Hera replied, Thou dost mock us, but our hearts are stirred with calamity, for already on the river Phasis the son of Aeson moors his ship, he and his comrades in quest of the golden fleece. For all their sakes we fear terribly, for the task is nigh at hand, but most for Aeson's son. Him will I deliver, though he sail even to Hades to free Ixion below from his brazen chains, as far as strength lies in my limbs." so that Peleus may not mock at having escaped an evil doom. Peleus, who left me unhonored with sacrifice. Moreover, Jason was greatly loved by me before, ever since the mouth of Inaris in flood, as I was making trial of men's righteousness. He met me on his return from the chase, and all the mountains and long-ridged peaks were sprinkled with snow, and from them the torrents rolled down were rushing with a roar, and he took pity on me in the likeness of an old crone, and raising me on his shoulders himself bore me through the headlong tide. So he is honoured by me unceasingly. Nor will Peleus pay the penalty of his outrage, unless thou wilt grant Jason his return. Thus she spoke, and speechlessness seized Cypris, and beholding Hera supplicating her, she felt awe, and then addressed her with friendly words. Dread goddess, may no viler thing than Cypris ever be found, if I disregard thy eager desire in word or deed, whatever my weak arms can effect, and let there be no favor in return. She spoke, and Hera again addressed her with prudence. It is not in need of might or in strength that we have come, but just quietly bid thy boy charm Aeti's daughter with love for Jason— For if she will aid him with her kindly counsel, easily do I think he will win the fleece of gold and return to Iolcus, for she is full of wiles. Thus she spoke, and Cypris addressed them both. Hera and Athena, he will obey you rather than me, for unabashed though he is, there will be some slight shame in his eyes before you. But he is no respect for me, but ever slights me in contentious mood. And, overborne by his naughtiness, I propose to break his ill-sounding arrows and his bow in his very sight, for in his anger he has threatened that if I shall not keep my hands off him while he still masters his temper, I shall have cause to blame myself thereafter. So she spoke, and the goddesses smiled and looked at each other, but Cypris again spoke, vexed at heart. To others my sorrows are a jest, nor ought I to tell them to all. I know them too well myself, but now, since this pleases you both, I will make the attempt and coax him, and he will not say me nay. Thus she spoke, and Hera took her slender hand and, gently smiling, replied, Perform this task, Catheria, straightway as thou sayest, and be not angry or contend with thy boy. He will cease hereafter to vex you. She spoke and left her seat, and Athena accompanied her, and they went forth both hastening back, and Cypris went on her way through the glens of Olympus to find her boy. And she found him apart in the blooming orchard of Zeus, not alone, but with him Ganymedes, who once Zeus had set to dwell among the immortal gods, being enamored of his beauty. 
and they were playing for golden dice as boys in one house are wont to do. An already greedy Eros was holding the palm of his left hand quite full of them under his breast, standing upright, and on the bloom of his cheeks a sweet blush was glowing. But the other sat crouching hard by, silent and downcast, and he had two dice left, which he threw one after the other, and was angered by the loud laughter of Eros. And lo, losing them straight away with the former, he went off empty-handed, helpless, and noticed not the approach of Kypris. And she stood before her boy, and laying her hand on his hips, addressed him. Why do you smile in triumph, unutterable rogue? Have you cheated him thus, and unjustly overcome the innocent child? Come, be ready to perform for me the task I will tell you of, and I will give you Zeus's all-beauteous plaything, the one which his dear nurse Adrestia made for him while he still lived a child with childish ways in the Idean cave, a well-rounded ball. No better toy will thou get from the hands of Hephaestus. All of gold are its zones, and round each double seams run a circle, but the stitches are hidden, and a dark blue spiral overlays them all. But if you should cast it with your hands, lo, like a star, it sends a flaming track through the sky. This I will give you, and do you strike with your shaft and charm the daughter of Aetes with love for Jason. And let there be no loitering, for then my thanks would be the slighter. Thus she spoke, and welcome were her words to the listening boy. And he threw down all his toys, and eagerly seizing her robe on this side, and that clung to the goddess. And he implored her to bestow the gift at once, but she, facing him with kindly words, touched his cheeks, kissed him, and drew him to her, and replied with a smile, be witness now thy dear head and mine, that surely I will give you the gift and deceive you not, if you will strike with your shaft Aetes' daughter. She spoke, and he gathered up his dice, and having well counted them all, threw them into his mother's gleaming lap, and straightway with golden baldric he slung round him his quiver from where it leant against a tree trunk, and took up his curved bow, and he fared forth through the fruitful orchard in the palace of Zeus. Then he passed through the gates of Olympus high in air, hence is a downward path from heaven, and the twin poles rear aloft steep mountain tops with highest crests of earth, where the risen sun grows ruddy with his first beams, and beneath him there appeared now the life-giving earth and cities of men and sacred streams of rivers, and now in turn mountain peaks and the ocean all around, as he swept through the vast expanse of air. Now the heroes, apart in ambush in a backwater of the river, were met in council, sitting on the benches of their ship, and Eason's son himself was speaking among them, and they were listening silently in their places, sitting row upon row. My friends, what pleases myself that will I say out? It is for you to bring about its fulfillment, for in common is our task, and common to all alike is the right of speech, and he who is silent withholds his thought and his counsel. Let him know that it is he alone that bereaves this band of its home return. Do you others rest here in the ship quietly with your arms? But I will go to the palace of Aetes, taking with me the sons of Phrixus and two comrades as well. And when I meet him, I will first make trial with words to see if he will be willing to give up the golden fleece for friendship's sake or not, but trusting to his might will set at naught our quest. For so, learning his forwardness, first from himself we will consider whether we shall meet him in battle or some other plan shall avail us if we refrain from the war cry. And let us not, merely by force, before putting words to the test, deprive him of his own possession. But first it is better to go to him and win his favor by speech. Oftentimes, I ween, does speech accomplish at need what prowess could hardly caddy through, smoothing the path in manner befitting. And he once welcomed noble Phrixus, a fugitive from his stepmother's wiles and the sacrifice prepared by his father— for all men everywhere, even the most shameless, reverence the ordinance of Zeus, god of strangers, and regard it. 
Thus he spoke, and the youths approved the words of Eason's son with one accord, nor was there one to counsel otherwise. And then he summoned to go with him the sons of Phrixus, and Telamon and Augeas, and himself took Hermes's wand. And at once they passed forth from the ship beyond the reeds and the water to dry land, toward the rising ground of the plain. The plain, I wis, is called Circes, and here in line grow many willows and osiers, on whose topmost branches hang corpses bound with cords. For even now it is an abomination with the Colchians to burn dead men with fire, nor is it lawful to place them in the earth and raise a mound above, but to wrap them in untanned oxhides and suspend them from trees far from the city." And so earth has an equal portion with air, seeing that they bury the women, for that is the custom of their land. And as they went, Hera, with friendly thought, spread a thick mist through the city, that they might fare to the palace of Aetes unseen by the countless hosts of the Colchians. But soon when from the plain they came to the city and Aetes' palace, then again Hera dispersed the mist. And they stood at the entrance, marveling at the king's courts and the wide gates and columns which rose in ordered lines round the halls, and high up on the palace a coping of stone rested on brazen triglyphs. And silently they crossed the threshold, and close by garden vines covered with green foliage were in full bloom, lifted high in air. And beneath them ran four fountains ever flowing, which Hephaestus had delved out. One was gushing with milk, one with wine, while the third flowed with fragrant oil, and on the fourth ran with water, which grew warm at the setting of the Pleiades, and in turn at their rising bubbled forth from the hollow rock, cold as crystal. Such then were the wondrous works that the craftsman god Hephaestus had fashioned in the palace of Kaiti and Aetes, and he wrought for them bowls with feet of bronze, and their mouths were of bronze, and from them they breathed out a terrible flame of fire." Moreover, he forged a plow of unbending adamant, all in one piece in payment for thanks to Helios, who had taken the god up in his chariot, when faint from the Phlegrian fight. And here an inner court was built, and round it were many well-fitted doors and chambers here and there, and all along on each side was a richly wrought gallery. And on both sides loftier buildings stood obliquely, in one which was the loftiest, lordly Aetes dwelt with his queen, and in another Absyrtus, son of Aetes, whom a Caucasian nymph, Asterodia, bare before he made Idea his wedded wife, the youngest daughter of Tethys and Oceanus, and the sons of the Colchians called him by the name of Phaethon, because he outshone all the youths. The other buildings the handmaidens had, and the two daughters of Aetes, Chalciope and Medea, Medea then they found going from chamber to chamber in search of her sister, for Hera detained her within that day. But before times she was not wont to haunt the palace, but all day long was busied in Hecate's temple, since she herself was a priestess of the goddess." And when she saw them, she cried aloud, and quickly Chalciope caught the sound, and her maids, throwing down at their feet their yarn and their thread, rushed forth all in a throng. And she, beholding her sons among them, raised her hands aloft through joy, and so they likewise greeted their mother. And when they saw her, embraced her in their gladness, and she, with many sobs, spoke thus. After all, then, you were not destined to leave me in your heedlessness and to wander far, but fate has turned you back. Poor wretch that I am, what a yearning for Hellas from some woeful madness seized you at the behest of your father Phrixus. Bitter sorrows for my heart did he ordain when dying. And why should you go to the city of Orchomenus, whoever this Orchomenus is, for the sake of Athamas's wealth, leaving your mother alone to bear her grief? 
Such were her words, and Aetes came forth last of all, and Idea herself came, the queen of Aetes, on hearing the voice of Chalciope, and straightway all the court was filled with a throng. Some of the thralls were busied with the mighty bull, others with the axe were cleaving dry billets, and others heating with fire water for the baths, nor was there one who relaxed his toil serving the king. Meantime, Eros passed unseen through the gray mist, causing confusion, as when against grazing heifers rises the gadfly, which oxherds call the breeze. And quickly beneath the lintel in the porch he strung his bow and took from the quiver an arrow unshot before, messenger of pain, and with swift feet unmarked he passed the threshold and keenly glanced around, and gliding close by Eason's son, he laid the arrow notch on the cord in the center, and drawing wide apart with both hands, he shot at Medea. And speechless amazement seized her soul, but the god himself flashed back again from the high-roofed hall, laughing loud, and the bolt burnt deep down in the maiden's heart like a flame, and ever she kept darting bright glances straight up at Eason's son, and within her breast her heart panted fast through anguish. All remembrance left her, and her soul melted with the sweet pain. And as a poor woman heaps dry twigs round a blazing brand, a daughter of toil whose task is the spinning of wool, that she may kindle a blaze at night beneath her roof when she has waked very early, and the flame waxing wondrous great from the small brand consumes all the twigs together. So, coiling round her heart, burnt secretly love, the destroyer, and the hue of her soft cheeks went and came, now pale, now red, in her soul's distraction. Now when the thralls had laid a banquet ready before them, and they had refreshed themselves with warm baths, gladly did they please their souls with meat and drink. And thereafter Aetes questioned the sons of his daughter, addressing them with these words. Sons of my daughter and of Phrixus, whom beyond all strangers I honored in my halls, how have you come returning back to Ea? Did some calamity cut short your escape in the midst? You did not listen when I set before you the boundless length of the way, for I marked it once whirled along in the chariot of my father Helios, when he was bringing my sister Circe to the western land, and we came to the shore of the Tyrrhenian mainland where even now she abides exceeding far from Colchis. But what pleasure is there in words? Do you tell me plainly what has been your fortune, and who these men are, your companions, and where from your hollow ship you came ashore? Such were his questions, and Argus, before all his brethren, being fearful for the mission of Aeson's son, gently replied, for he was the elder born. Aetes, that ship forthwith stormy blast tore asunder, and ourselves, crouching on the beams, a wave drove on to the beach of the isle of Enialius in the murky night, and some god preserved us. For even the birds of Ares that haunted the desert isle before time, not even them did we find. But these men had driven them off, having landed from their ship on the day before, and the will of Zeus, taking pity on us, or some fate, detained them there, since they straightway gave us both food and clothing in abundance, when they heard the illustrious name of Phrixus and thine own. For to your city are they faring, and if you wish to know their errand, I will not hide it from time. A certain king, vehemently longing to drive this man far from his fatherland and possessions, because in might he outshone all the sons of Aeolus, sends him to voyage hither on a bootless venture, and asserts that the stocks of Aeolus will not escape the heart-grieving wrath and rage of implacable Zeus, nor the unbearable curse and vengeance due for Phrixus, until the fleece comes back to Hellas. And their ship was fashioned by Pallas Athena, not such a one as there are ships among the Colchians, on the vilest of which we were chanced. 
for the fierce waves and wind broke her utterly to pieces, but the other holds firm with her bolts, even though all the blast should buffet her. And with equal swiftness she speedeth before the wind, and when the crew ply the oar with unresting hands. And he hath gathered in her the mightiest heroes of all Achaea, and hath come to the, her city from wandering far through cities and gulfs of the dread ocean, in the hope that you will grant him the fleece. But as you please, so it shall be, for he comes not to use force, but is eager to pay you a recompense for the gift. He has heard from me of your bitter foes, the sour mati, and he will subdue them to your sway. And if you desire to know their names and lineage, I will tell you all. This man, on whose account the rest were gathered from Hellas, they call Jason, son of Eson, whom Cretheus begat, and if in truth he is one of the stock of Cretheus himself, thus he would be our kinsman on the father's side, for Cretheus and Athamas were both sons of Aeolus, and Phrixus was the son of Athamas, son of Aeolus. And here, if you have heard all of the seeds of Helios, you do behold Augeus, and this is Telamon, sprung from famous Iacus, and Zeus himself begat Iacus. And so all the rest, all the comrades that follow him, are the sons or grandsons of the immortals. Such was the tale of Argus, but the king at his words was filled with rage as he heard, and his heart was lifted high in wrath. And he spoke in heavy displeasure, and was angered most of all with the son of Chalciope, for he deemed that on their account the strangers had come, and in his fury his eyes flashed forth beneath his brows. Be gone from my sight, felon, straightway, you and your tricks from the land, ere someone see a fleece and a phrixis to his sorrow. Banded together with your friends from Hellas, not for the fleece, but to seize my scepter and royal power have you come hither. Had you not first tasted of my table, surely would I have cut out your tongues and hewn off both hands and sent you forth with your feet alone, so that you might be stayed from starting hereafter. And what lies have you uttered against the blessed gods? Thus he spoke in his wrath, and mightily from its depths swelled the heart of Iacus' son, and his soul within longed to speak a deadly word in defiance. But Eson's son checked him, for he himself first made gentle answer. Aetes, bear with this armed band, I pray, for not in the way you deemest have we come to your city and palace, no, nor yet with such desires. For who would of his own will dare to cross so wide a sea for the goods of a stranger? But fate and the ruthless command of a presumptuous king urged me, Grant a favor to your suppliants, and to all Hellas will I publish a glorious fame of you. Yeah, we are now ready to pay you a swift recompense in war, whether it be the Sauromati or some other people that you are eager to subdue to your sway. He spoke, flattering him with gentle utterance, but the king's soul brooded a twofold purpose within him, whether he should attack and slay them on the spot, or should make trial of their might. And this, as he pondered, seemed the better way, and he addressed Jason in answer. Stranger, why do you need to go through your tale to the end? For if you are in truly of heavenly race, or have come in no wise inferior to me to win the goods of strangers, I will give you the fleece to bear away, if you wish, when I have tried you. For against brave men I bear no grudge, such as yourselves tell me of him who bears sway in Hellas, and the trial of your courage and might shall be a contest, which I myself can compass with my hands, deadly though it be. Two bulls with feet of bronze I have that pasture on the plain of Ares, breathing forth flame from their jaws. Them do I yoke and drive over the stubborn field of Ares, four plough gates and quickly cleaving it with share up to the headland. I cast into the furrows the seed, not the corn of Demeter, but the teeth, of a dread serpent that grow up into the fashion of armed men. Them I slay at once, cutting them down beneath my spear as they rise against me on all sides. 
In the morning do I yoke the oxen, and at even tide I cease from the harvesting. And you, if you will accomplish such deeds as these, on that very day shall carry off the fleece to the king's palace. Ere that time comes, I will not give it. Expect it not. For indeed it is unseemly that a brave man should yield to a coward." Thus he spoke, and Jason, fixing his eyes on the ground, sat just as he was, speechless, helpless in his evil plight. For a long time he turned the matter this way and that, and could in no way take on him the task with courage, for a mighty task it seemed, and at last he made reply with crafty words. With your plea of right, Aetes, you do shut me in overmuch, whereas also I will dare that contest, monstrous as it is, though it be my doom to die, for nothing will fall upon men more dread than dire necessity, which indeed constrained me to come hither at a king's command." I think we'll end it there today. Next reading. Oh, those trials of Jason and how he literally can't do anything without Medea. <sighs> but we'll get there. One thing of interest that I noticed while reading all of this to you is that there's like a little myth tucked in this myth, which is of those children of Phrixus and Chalciope. So Chalciope is a daughter of Aetes, but it seems like there was a time when she had kids with this guy named Phrixus. This actually links back to the naming of the Hellespont. I think I've told the myth before. Um, I can't get into it right now because I haven't looked into it fully. But if you're interested, you can Google Phrixus and the Hellespont and all of that. Or, you know, I'll cover it in the future. But either way, it's interesting. There's a little myth tucked right into the middle here. One that I had completely forgotten about. Thank you all so much for listening. This is so much fun. As usual, next week uh, should be another conversation episode and then more Argonautica after that. You are all so wonderful. Thank you. I am Liv and I love this shit. Mm -hmm.